Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 703, that is 704 with I, your host Agostino, the Agostino Zynga show episode number 704 aka 704. How are you? How are you feeling? great good to know how am i you know doing the best i can with the time i have available doing the best i can with the time i have available but i do have to tell you most of you know if you you know have friends and colleagues and family in the uk it's been absolutely hotter than hot over here hotter than hot global warming is real (laughs) or just we have temperamental weather here in the uk it's been crazy and the common complaint that I always have with the UK when it comes to weather, it's just never consistent. Like I would much rather if we had, if we lived in a country where the weather was, let's say every year we had like four weeks of like back to back sun, right? Maybe roughly around the times of like, let's say you were between like May to August, you knew you're going to have a four week block of back to back sun back-to-back hot temperatures i'm cool with that i can plan accordingly i can you know get my my living situation sorted out maybe um spruce up my wardrobe or know what to wear bloody blah 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 it's easy to plan but we have these random little occurrences like we're having now in the somewhat middle of september um you know basically at the end of the summer heading into autumn into winter where suddenly it becomes super warm and you're not prepared for it you're not expecting it and it kind of takes you you know by surprise and most of the places that i've lived in in london unfortunately have been you know new built flats or apartments of some ilk and unless i'm living in a council house which my parents currently live in which is a little bit cooler most new build flats or new builds you're living in they have a insulation thing where essentially they try and help the occupants save money on heating or maybe it's to help them save money eating who knows so usually they're pretty well insulated so that in the winter you don't really need to turn on your heating and then if you do fair enough you might need the warmth but for the most part you can get away with just putting on a sweater and you're perfectly fine but in the summer in the summer it turns your apartment your flat into a flipping greenhouse it turns it into a conservatory it turns it into a sauna it makes it absolutely baking and there's nothing you can do to help it because for the most part unless you live somewhere where there is a lot of high-rise buildings around you you're going to get the sun not only beating into your fucking double glazing windows which essentially turns the heat into it turns they basically act as magnifying glasses to steam up and boil up your house if you live in a building with loads of people there's loads of people moving around in there if you're in a flat with loads of people apartment wise there's people moving around in there if you start cooking and making food you're act, adding to the heat if you shower you're adding to the heat everything you're adding to the flipping heat and it's absolutely annoying and that's the one thing that kind of makes it hard to sort of maneuver and navigate around which is why usually when you go out you won't see many people it's strange in london like that it's like you'll see people but not really a lot because no one really wants to be outside melting and you know stinking up the place looking all disheveled and shit and flustered because you know what you're going to travel to meet your friends in this type of heat you jump on the train okay good luck you're sweating on a train unless you're in an overground line or you're on a flipping elizabeth line that has some ventilation or it mostly travels above ground so it does open up so you get some fresh air in if you travel on the actual underground you're cooked you're getting cooked like a flipping you know like a boiled sausage that's how you're getting cooked and it's absolutely annoying and i flipping hate it really and truly i really really do and it kind of makes me long for and hope that the winter months are going to start very soon because the one thing i love is winter i love getting dressed for winter um i love just you know the kind of lock-in mode i have usually when it's the winter month i love everything about it um summers for me don't really work and most of it has to do with my terrible experience living in london having to put up with this absolute crazy 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 heat so i can't wait until it sort of dies down and we get to some level of normality because this is this for me is too much i have to be honest it's just way 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 too much i need to live in a some level of like normalcy i can't be having this be my day-to-day <laughs> please for the love of god and i cannot cannot wait until the temperature cools but for the most part it's been good for the gym um, every time i go to a gym especially during this week is fairly empty 
no one really wants to be even though the gym i go to now has has some level of air conditioning it is kind of cool in there you see people don't want to you know be in there if they don't need to be in there so that makes it easier to go do your training and kind of bounce so i'm happy about that um and what else apart from that nothing else has been really occurring I haven't been out for a while maybe we'll go out this weekend to do a little pirate dj set but apart from that i've been freaking you know compounding my misery by jumping on twitter spaces and ranting and raving with fellow united fans about the state of my club and then realizing you know what there's really little or nothing i can do about the situation which is incredibly 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 annoying but hey what can you do talk about the situation at hand i'm sure most of you are aware of the current state of my bloody club and what's happening and just how fraught everything is going at the moment we have an issue happening with um anthony one of our wingers where he's been accused by one of his former girlfriends of assault um some very dicey dicey things there's been pictures of a hand that looks like it's been broken there's been accounts of allegedly um this young lady's uh breast implant being ruptured there's even conversation i've heard along on the interweb somewhere of something to do with a miscarriage so it's pretty dicey allegations against um anthony obviously he's innocent until proven guilty but with the issues happening or the with the issues that we kind of put to bed with mason greenwood um being accused of an attempted rape on his then girlfriend who is now back together with who they're now fitting a baby with which is crazy and then of course the issues with sancho where he's not being able to play and he's upset about the manager calling him out in press conferences it's just compounded the issues and essentially highlighted just how much of a mess we are as a club and the fact that the fact that we've been so leaderless rudderless um and lacking in direction from our owners the glazers has basically led to the situation now i'm not somebody that's always going to blame the guys for every single ill but when it comes to these type of issues which are more um you know um behavioral um and just lack of professionalism you know how we approached it there's issues there's even stories i've heard of allegedly some man united physio or doctor being involved in covering up the issue with the anthony's then ex-girlfriend which is flipping crazy which essentially looks like they covered it up in some regard even if they just tended medical aid the fact that they were involved in that in any way shape or form is absolutely ridiculous and it doesn't obviously bode well for the image of the club in current situation um the only hope that we have right now is that some way shape or form this might be embarrassing enough of an issue that it might force the glazers to speed up the sale process because so far if i'm not mistaken it's now like eight months since um the glazers um entertained the idea of selling the club um but so far we've had no real resolution there are rumors out there that the um, saudis have won the race to buy united but still until it's confirmed i'm not going to celebrate i'm not going to get giddy because the one thing the glazers are masters at wizards world class in every department is their ability to you know consistently disappoint and let down united fans and kind of sell us one thing and then pull out another thing a good example being the director of football role a lot of united fans thought that that role was going to be the be on end to sort out our issues i think now we've all kind of realized until the glazers leave we are never going to win a major trophy ever again unless we have the ability to stumble across a Sellers ferguson region um that's never happening um obviously Ericsson Hogg is a good manager but he's not Sellers ferguson and i think unless we get rid of the glazers unless they are willing to sell and hand the keys over to new owners who actually want to win stuff then we are never gonna ever 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 win a major trophy ever again i can say that you know with a level of certainty that i won't say anything else in my life but we've seen the kind of you know what's been happening in the trends occurring in football the fact that other clubs who are to quote unquote smaller have already got their act together the fact that the biggest clubs are kind of pulling away to suggest that all it takes is a couple of transfer windows um you know and whatever and a good manager to get to that kind of level is ridiculous clubs have been putting in work for you know five plus years now i'm um, laying the groundwork for some big things and we think money can solve all things i don't think so we have to real need we need a real change of leadership and that's the only way to kind of get things done anyway going back to the entity stuff um united have finally put out a statement regarding it and sort of put some distance between themselves and Anthony which you would imagine is an indication that more likely than not Anthony's days at United are numbered 
I don't think he's going to come back anytime soon, to be completely honest. This looks like they are properly, you know, trying to wash their hands of the guy because they don't want to be caught in any sort of passer. So, um, according to this article here, via the hold on let me see if I can get there you go via the um, the United Club statement they said on Anthony not many words have been said here of course United are the club of um you know the they're the club that doesn't really like to you know expound on certain things the club of the So here's a statement courtesy of United, um, not short, short and snappy, right to the point. It says, Man United acknowledges the allegations made against Anthony. Players who have not participated in international matches are due to be back on Monday. However, it's been agreed with Anthony that he'll delay his return until further notice in order to address the allegations. As a club, we condemn acts of violence and abuse. We recognize the importance of safeguarding all those involved in the situation and acknowledge the impact the allegations have on survivors of abuse. So they're just trying to tick all the boxes to sound like they're progressive, to sound like they give a fuck but they clearly don't if there's any sort of truth in the allegations that they covered it up or that they lended medical aid to this lady when she was abused by one of our players it's going to look incredibly bad on them so they're trying their best to pr up whatever has happened but just in general considering sancho's um grievances are not playing this is making a lot more sense now if you are kind of um, charitable to all parties involved i would say a fair person would say you understand why Sancho's upset about not getting enough playing time. And you can also understand Eric Ten Hag's frustration, um, considering all the work he's kind of done away from f the football pitch to kind of make Sancho comfortable and to get him back to a good state mentally to kind of play football again or to perform at the levels that need be. You can understand why both parties are pissed off. But more so looking at the Sancho point of view, this adds a lot more context because in a statement that Sancho put out, I remember him specifically saying there are other things at play that are not allowing him to kind of play on that pitch, which makes a lot of sense now because Anthony was one of Eric Ten Hag's big marquee signings. When Eric Ten Hag has at Ajax, Anthony was one of his most important players. He was a player, he was kind of his go-to guy, the kind of guy that came up clutch for Ajax in some of the most important moments. The guy that I kind of the player that I fell in love with was a player that I saw under Eric Ten Hag's tutelage. So obviously him coming into United was maybe a big deal to Sancho because he was a player that was hired by our previous manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And to have another star winger come in, you kind of immediately think it's going to limit your chances of playing because this is going to be his guy. It's fair that he's his guy, but the issue that I've always had with Eric Ten Hag is that he clearly has favourites. And for some reason like other managers have favorites fair but he doesn't like to rotate he doesn't trust his backup players he would rather play Bruno Fernandes with one leg than ever give Donny van der Beek a chance of a run of games for five games or something to impress he doesn't really like to do that for some reason which you know he has his reasons to do it maybe you know people's stats kind of get them uh you know a flipping um get them to be the first name on the team sheet but I think that has led Overall, and again, the other alternate, you know, the other interior um, politics that go in at United, things concerning England players, particular sponsored players, it adds to the overall, I think, bad um, feeling and vibe in the dressing room where there's definitely some players in there who think certain players aren't better than them, but they get picked ahead of them. We already saw the drama that happened with Eric Bailly and Harry Maguire being a good example. And I'm sure there are certain players in the team who feel like certain players only play because of their profile and they don't necessarily get the same treatment as other players because of their profile, because of their celebrity, because of their endorsements and deals and shit. And I'm thinking I'm looking at people like Marcus Rashford. So I think that has added to the ill intent, to the ill feeling around Sancho towards the manager because he's thinking... I'm not only not getting picked for football reasons, there are other reasons at play and this might be it. Sancho and the players were probably aware of the allegations and what was happening behind the scenes with Anthony and for Sancho he's probably thinking hey how is this guy still playing with all this stuff around his name and I don't get a chance to play when you know when this stuff comes out you're going to have to rely on me anyway. Do you know what I mean? And that's essentially what happened. Essentially now we're hearing kind of stories come out that um Eric Ten Hag is set for showdown talks with Sancho this week. So to Monday, as probably you're hearing this podcast, Eric Ten Hag is going to have a clear the air meeting with Sancho. And depending on how that meeting goes, they're going to decide how to reintegrate him back into the team or put him in the youths and ship him out in January. But either way, they're going to be more reliant on him and and Facundo and Palestri because now Anthony's out of the team. So all those players that were eager to play and eager to get rotated are going to be relied on because his star man's kind of gone, which is really, 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 really suspect, to be honest. But again, you can kind of understand it because, you know, 
United move really suspect anyway, so I'm never surprised by some of the stuff that my flipping team does. But then if you want to get an an understanding of the allegations, because they're kind of dicey, it's also kind of questionable because I feel like maybe Anthony has a grievance too. Maybe he has a point to be annoyed at the club because it feels like the club are trying to make up for all the bad things they did um, with the Mason Greenwood situation because I'm somebody who I have to say, I'm one of those people who believe that in football, they kind of approach it the right way in terms of unless there's an open investigation about you, they don't really try to take you out of the team. If it's just people talking on the internet and it's a quote-unquote cancel culture, me too type of thing, they just let it play out. However heinous and deplorable the allegations are, they let it play out. I look at people like Thomas Partey being a good example. That situation looked a bit crazy with a woman that accused him of rape and shit, but unfortunately for her, she wasn't able to file the, I think the, she wasn't able to make a case for it because too much time had passed or something along those kind of lines. So nothing basically happened. But the entire time that whole thing was on media, was on social media, I also continued to play him. They didn't give a fuck. But of course, once he, if he was ever to get um, charged and he was a police investigation, then they would go and make that step of like taking him out of the team, which I think is what you should do, which is kind of football's way of doing the whole innocent until proven thing. In so, um, innocent until guilty type of thing which I think is what should have happened with this kind of case you're innocent until proven guilty then you kind of continue on but of course with football teams they try to occupy both sides they want to be the morality police and they also want to be professional clubs that have nothing to do with the players you know personal lives and shit but I think you have to choose one or the other you can't dip and you can't hop and skip between both camps depending on who the player you have to have a hard and fast rule about what you're trying to and how you're going to deal with the situations whether you're going to deal with it and say hey he's innocent until proven guilty or whether you're going to deal with it and say we have morals and principles that we stand on this is not something that we want our players to even be associated with so if he's out do you have to decide which one you kind of fall in and unfortunately my club has kind of you know danced between the two and now we're in the situation but the allegations against Anthony are interesting because they kind of seem a bit, they kind of seem a bit, you know, I don't know. Um, here's course, courtesy of Sky Sports. It says, Anthony further um, allegations of assault about the United Winger emerged in the Brazilian media. Um, a lady got interviewed by Brazilian media. Anthony also got inter- interviewed by Brazilian media and he vehemently denies the allegations. Um, the article says, Anthony was dropped from Brazil earlier this week following an initial allegations made by former girlfriend Gabriela Cav- Cavallin. Um, Raisa de Freitas claims that she required hospital treatment um, after being assaulted by Anthony a woman and a woman in May 2022. According to reports in various outlets, de Freitas um, reported that the alleged incident um, to the Sao Paulo Civil Police. Another woman, Ingrid Lana, has claimed in a television interview that she was pressured by Anthony to have sex while on the business trip to England last year. So all these women are coming out of the woodwork about Anthony. Um, Lana alleged Anthony invited her to his house and pushed her against the wall, which led to her banging her head. He tried to have a relationship with me. I didn't want to, said Lana. He pushed me against the wall and I hit my head. My purpose was just business. Arriving there at his invitation, I realized he had other ulterior motives. May and I declined to comment when contacted by Sky Sports News. And then, of course, the recent update, um, as I told you previously about the um, about the break that they're going to be having. And Anthony also put out a statement. He says, I have agreed we may united to take a period of absence when I'll address the allegations made against me. This is a mutual decision to avoid distraction to my teammates and unnecessary controversy for the club. I want to reiterate my innocence to the things that I've been accused of and I fully um, cooperate with the police to help them reach the ultimate truth. I look forward to return to play as soon as possible. So again, I'm not too sure who to believe in this. It seems a little bit he said, she said. I just wish my club would have dealt with it in a far more professional manner so that we didn't have all these internal issues going on and bubbling, you know, in the background. Because I'm sure this is what led to some of the ill feeling amongst certain players in the team when they're seeing other players get professional uh, preferential treatment, especially when they've got all this stuff lingering above them. It's absolutely heinous. And again, this weekend hasn't been the greatest because Harry Maguire, a player for us who is absolutely horrendous, but we have been incapable of selling him because he's a big name England player and he came with a big price tag and you know he's on a huge salary and people probably don't want to sign him and he's clearly okay with seeing out his contract because yeah he signed the contract but he played obviously against Ukraine the other day for England and a mistake that he'd done in the box again it wasn't the goal wasn't his fault but it's just the optics again of one of our players just 
to being disastrous on international duty, where he looked like he was hugging one of his own players instead of marking the the you know the player needed in the box, and as the judge Zinchenko ended up sliding it in to the bottom corner to make it one 0 Ukraine at the time, but eventually we end up drawing. But still, the optics aren't great. It's not been a great weekend for United players. Um, overall, my theory on this going forward is that like i said before i think this is the most clearest example ever of a need of new ownership i think one could argue the lack of transfer activity our very average midfield our lacking quality in depth the striking options are not really where they need to be the style of play is horrendous there's loads of things that are really an issue at united at the moment but i think honestly one of the biggest changes that we could make in this modern era of United, something that will actually put us in the right direction or on the way to kind of getting back where we need to be, is if we change owners. Without the change of ship of owners, no amount of transfer budgets, no amount of player overhauls, no amount of managerial changes, because I see some fans out there, you know, saying Ten Hag out, myself included, and wanted De Zerbi in because he's the flavour of the month. That's not going to help. De Zerbi is only doing well at Brighton because they have an infrastructure there that allows managers like him to do well. It's no coincidence that all these quote-unquote great managers that we've had at United can't come in at the club and sink yes the club is incredibly big yes the badge is very heavy but there's no coincidence that all the managers think of even David Moyes and what he's doing at West Ham they come to United and they sink why because there's no infrastructure to support them and to bring out the best in them we're not really a team or a club that's looking to win trophies we're a team that essentially is there to finance um you know the Glazers flipping extravagant trips to see you know to watch fucking Formula One races and shit they're not really here for sporting success and if it was the decisions um that we make for player recruitment managerial um you know changes and even style of play would be in that direction but it's not it's always these glitz, glitzy signings that really don't make no sense Mason Mount being a good example um, just for the optics just for the fucking media um, just for the PR and then it's no real kind of rhyme or reason and then in the end the fans suffer because the player comes they play like fucking shit the team suffers and then we have many more years of misery continuing on so let's see how it plays out um, it's going to be a good opportunity for the likes of um, Pelestri to get minutes on the pitch because he was never going to play before that I did hear a report um beforehand that um Pelestri's people had a meeting with Eric Ten Hag before the transfer window opened and basically said hey we want him to play football he wants to play football what's the deal and you know Eric Ten Hag reiterated to Pelestri's team I want him here he's going to be an option to play please don't leave and he still hasn't played right I don't think he's got many minutes I think he's maybe had two appearances so far and we're already 10 percent into the season. you know four or five games of the season of stuff along the lines so it's a big issue already you know it's already a big issue so now that anthony is gone um and maybe sancho also might be gone depending on how the talks go later um it's going to be a chance for the likes of pleasure to come in and actually get some game time um and fingers crossed he does and you know it doesn't end up being just Erickson Hogg doing what he probably would do and playing Mount right wing or Bruno right wing instead of actually playing an out and out winger because he doesn't trust those guys but let's see how it plays out and of course we've got Amrabat um, to come in as well but he's injured classic which is just our luck but once he gets going I think we should have a solid enough base but as per usual once a couple of players get injured it's back to square one again so I hope the ownership thing gets sorted because we need that change sooner rather than later more so than any other club out there we need that change sooner rather than later so another thing to talk about here big news concerning the Luis um, Rublas issue the president of Spanish FA who I've been speaking about on the podcast uh, for a bit now regarding the infamous kiss that he gave to Jenny Halmosa when the Spanish women's team won the Women's World Cup now at the time that I said it and I'm honestly going to stand on it I think there is a scenario where Luis Rublas who did what he did in 4k could have still kept his job if he just apologized the fact that he was unwilling to apologize unwilling to admit, admit fault unwilling to meet people where they're at and understand why they the viewers watching or even the player that uh, well, that was the victim of the forced kiss were not that happy with it unwilling to do so his hubris his arrogance is what led to him having to resign there was a scenario where if he would have responded quickly he was sincere he actually acknowledged what he did wrong and understood why it could it could be looked at very very badly and tried to make amends and personally contacted jenny hermoso hermoso sorry to make it right 
there's a possibility that he could have kept his job. But the fact that he re refused, um, said that he was not going anywhere, had the press conference and essentially roped in all his colleagues into the flipping nonsense and made them look bad, took away, more importantly, the attention for the women's world, from the Spain women's team, from winning the World Cup against England on fucking penalties, right? A very nail-biting experience. All the attention gets put on him only and not on the team and their heroic exploits. And then in general, it then leads to the Spanish women's team deciding, hey, we're we're on strike. We're not playing again until that guy is out of his job. And then the manager, I think, also backed up the players and the manager of the women's team gets sacked because of his support of a player that got fucking sexually assaulted. Absolutely crazy. Well, Luis Ribles has finally resigned. He's finally seen sense. And he, he announced it in the most insane way possible he went on Piers Morgan to announce it he flew over to fucking the UK and decided to announce exclusively on Piers Morgan that he was going to step down as head of the press of the Spanish FA very strange thing to do if you would have had that same level of um you know uh determination and, and you know whatever it may be to get to the UK and do it in reporters right after the situation he probably could have kept his job but hey it is what it is let's play the clip of um what you call it, Pierce Morgan interviewing Lewis Rubles and kind of talking to him about the whole thing. And it's a little excerpt from the whole interview. But it's interesting how he basically paints himself in this interview because it's almost like he's trying to say he's the victim when it's strange because we already saw the video. But anyway, let's play it. You've come under ferocious pressure for three weeks now on you, on your family. It's been very difficult for your daughters, their young girls. I can only imagine as a father myself, I have a daughter who's around the age of one of your girls. Incredibly difficult. There comes a point, perhaps, when the pressure is just so relent relentless that you do think about what you should do with yourself and your future. Many people think you should resign as president. You look something like Pablo Zabaleta, isn't it? Jesus. I love so much my daughters. <laughs> and and they, they love me so, so much. I... Surprise. I'm very happy. And I'm very proud of them. Very, very proud of them. They are very near to me. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm go You're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going to. Yes, because I cannot continue my work. <laughs> what was the final <laughs> moment for you? Was it talking to your family, your dad perhaps? Uh, yeah, my, my, my father, uh, my daughters, I spoke with, with them. Um, it's not... They know it's, it's not a question about me and some friends very, very close to me. Uh, and they say to me, Luis, now you have to focus in your dignity and to continue your life. Because uh, if not, probably you are going to damage people you love and the sport you love and the beat you built with uh, some people long time ago. Now it's very, very near the resolution next September in one year. Then when someone is not thinking only about himself, because I had to support a lot these uh, three weeks, but this uh, oh, it's been three weeks. a question sure. of not only me. And then an attitude, of, an attitude of me can affect third parties very important. And this is the, in this situation now, uh, the more intelligent and the of course, the more intentional thing is to do that, but he should have done it in the beginning. I just don't understand the arrogance of the whole situation. Like, I think most sensible men, most men who are well adjusted and not absolute heathens, even if that their intention wasn't bad, because we all saw what happened, right? We all saw the video. We all can understand what would lead somebody to do what he did in the heat of the moment of the fucking win of the world cup he decides to embrace her and he had most one of the star players and give her a kiss on the cheek on the lips right before he did that every other player he kissed he hugged and kind of lifted up it was a bit weird anyway it's a little bit too much i thought personally um he was grabbing them and twirling them around and stuff but they all seemed to be fairly okay with it because i guess they know him to be quite a tactile guy happy go lucky they never take it too seriously the kiss journey her most were just a little bit over the top she says she wasn't comfortable with it. Any normal guy would be shell shocked about that thing, right? Because you'd automatically you think people would look at you like you're some sort of abuser, rapist, creep guy. So you'd want to do the best possible to 
you know rectify the situation you'd contact the person directly if you can if not you'd make a public statement apologizing profusely for what you did saying you didn't mean it the way it came off bloody blah you would make sure it was clear crystal clear that's not what your intention was although you understand how it looks you do everything to make it right if they'd requested then you to resign you would resign but usually in a civil normal weather justice society people would see how repentful and how remorseful you were and they would say you know what fair enough and maybe later on you would still have to resign anyway because the pressure would be too much but you would you would be seen as still a good guy kind of you wouldn't be seen as a dickhead like he is now because he refused to resign did that whole co press conference about i will not resign um had all his colleagues basically you know made his co colleagues complicit in it because he's the president so it's technically their boss they have to sit there and clap it's sort of basically north korea type of vibes you know because it then will look bad on them as well so they get complete they're they're complicit in it and i'm sure the spanish media were running their names through the mud people on spanish social media were probably pointing at people in the crowd saying oh my god embarrassing embarrassing da, 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 da. and one of the other things i find hilarious in the fucking conversation was this idea that men can only understand um sexual assault if they have daughters if they have mothers if they have sisters i find that incredibly insane that makes us look so fucking um that makes us look like absolute cavemen that we have no ability to understand or to view things from a woman's point of view unless we have daughters like we have no ability to understand humans and their feelings and their emotions unless we know somebody directly like that it's un absolutely insane i'm sure there are some guys who have that kind of feeling but it is absolutely wild and i feel like in this particular case using the daughter thing as an excuse is insane um really 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 is because then it also suggests that just because you have daughters that you don't have any there's no ability of us of a man who has daughters to ever do anything untowards to a, to a woman that's absolutely insane but i also think one of the biggest crimes in my opinion for this especially when it comes to lewis Ribless, when it comes to this issue his biggest crime for me was what he put his mom through don't get me wrong his mom seems like a little bit of a you know she's a little bit on the fringes herself and she's probably one of those typical mediterranean mums who doesn't play when it comes to her children but the fact that Louis Ribles put his poor mum in a position where she went on a hunger strike to the point where she had to be admitted to hospital because of the complications around it and how ill she got that to me paints him more as a bad dude than even what he did to Jenny Hermosa the Jenny Hermosa thing could be explained away. He of the moment, you were too excited, whatever, and you planned a kiss on it. Although I think I remember reading there was pieces and articles of, you know, this guy speaking very glowingly about Jenny Hermosa and about how much he liked her and shit, blah, 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 blah. So it obviously makes the kiss look a little bit premeditated. But regardless, you can you can explain that to some re some regard and still look kind of decent. But doing a bad thing refusing to apologize when everyone's pointed out as a bad thing and then putting your mum through this i think makes you a bad guy in my opinion um, headline coach of cnn sports mother of spanish soccer chief luis Rubiles released from hospital after church hunger strike according to reports the mother of a uh, beleaguered and spanish uh, soccer chief luis Rubiles, who was admitted to hospital in the spanish town of montreal um, after a hunger strike has been discharged according to spanish media outlets um angelas beja or beja um, locked herself in the divinity pastora church in her hometown of montreal in the southern of spain on monday to protest the treatment of her son after he was suspended by the fa for forcibly kissing women's soccer world cup winner um jennifer hermoso in the final um when asked by cnn espanol about Beja, the hospital santa ana in montreal refused to make any comments citing privacy protection a priest of the church who identified himself as father antonio told reporters that Beja had been taken to the hospital on wednesday after becoming anguished and dizzy so she only lasted two days in a hunger strike at church fasting and praying to you know for protection and to send bad vibes to the haters and the trolls who were attacking her son and then she put herself in fucking hospital because of it that is unforgivable in my opinion um i need to tell you that she and again he didn't mention his mom in, the, in that little i know it's a trailer but he didn't mention his mom in that trailer right he didn't mention how you know he put his mom through that and he feels bad about it um i need to tell you that she had a crisis she has worsened and they needed to take her urgent hospital says father antonio so she's not here anymore she had to leave for the hospital because the women has already tried and had lots of issues already even some at, anemic issues so she had to leave 
Um, she he had said Louis Ribles had spoken with his mother before she was taken to hospital. Her son called her. Yes, he has called her, and they have been in touch. He called her. He didn't even go great son and among all of them the family that decided she needed to go to hospital a friend of Ribles's mother previously told CNN in Portugal that he had already been she had been recently in poor health so this, this mother already has underlying health issues fucking hell boy this Lewis guy is basically the worst son of the year but thought that she had likely hold out until the end with her hunger strike Beha was previously um, said that her goal was to protest that she what she called um, an inhumane bloodthirsty hunt against her son according to spanish media reports cnn portugal reported that the church early this week spoke to a friend of rubles's mother who described the backlash against rubles as an injustice <laughs> you can maybe say it was over the top but you can't say it was an injustice somebody is well within their rights to not be happy about you kissing them uninvited <laughs> <laughs> they're within their rights the reaction from the media and everybody else calling you a rapist all this sort of stuff that can be your un that can be a little bit over the top but to say it's, it's an injustice is like huh mounting pressure spain defeated england at the world cup this month but the team's triumph had been overshadowed by the now um by the rouse surrounding rubis and the significance anger of the women's team against his leadership rubis has admitted that he made a mistake kissing Ramaso, but he claimed that the act was consensual which is insane to say that because even if it was consensual the person then decided later on that they didn't like it you still owe them an apology that's the thing that he doesn't understand you cannot be happy about it you can think it's a bit two-faced and she tried to maybe get you know um counsel you and stuff you can think what you want but if the person says they were not happy even if after they said they were happy to do at the time you still owe them an apology in my opinion especially if you're a public figure somewhat in a, that sort of position you owe them a fucking apology um rubles was suspended but by fifa again super corrupt fifa stepped in uh, before the spanish fa which says more about them um than anything uh which says more about spanish fa sorry than the fifa um rubles suspended by fifa soccer's global governing body over the weekend uh, under the terms of the suspension the spanish football federation the ref um has appointed an interim president to replace rubles during the 19 days he was banned on monday um the 19 regional presidents of the soccer federation called rubles to resign while offering unanimous support for the interim Pedro Roca. The pressure on Ribeles to step down in, in for, from his position at the Irish president has not only intensified since he dramatically refused to do so during a speech at the presidency, during a speech at the Federation Extraordinary General Assembly on Friday, saying he would fight to the end. Um, the Spanish prosecution are considering whether to press sexual <laughs> aggression charges against Ribeles. See what I mean? If you just would have apologized, went out of his dignity, resigned, you know, offered his resignation as a piecemeal. Imagine if he did that. You applauded straight away and said, look, if you want me to resign, I will. And then offered it up. People said, hey, don't worry. You're being too extra. We'll, we take your apology. He'll be fine. But now he might have sh actually have criminal charges levied against him over this whole fucking affair. Crazy. He made the whole Spanish women's team go and strike. He made other players go and strike. He had all these people on the media saying things about him, um, putting the hashtags and shit. Awful. And he thought he was bigger than a program. Nobody's bigger than a program. He honestly thought they were going to stand by him and have all these people go on strike, have all these people resign, have all this bad press around them. And he was in a strong enough leadership position where they were going to back him. And obviously, it's been proven that that wasn't the case. Um, and then I guess for me, the crazy thing for this as well, it's just, it does, ha it has illustrated the real difference in approach in countries with this thing because i feel like if this happened in england he would have been gone in an instant but it's interesting to see how different countries in the world deal with these um you know council culture me to women's sex you know sexual assault type of things in public they deal with it in very different ways and spain has a very it's almost backwards way of dealing with this sort of thing where it was actually a big deal that this actually became a big deal because most of the, often than not it gets swept under the rug so the fact that they actually acknowledged that this was an issue and they actually said that this was a problem is a big step for them in terms of their culture going forward but it's just funny to see him play how he actually represented the old school you know what i mean his determination in his eyes the fact that he saw nothing wrong with it the fact that everyone else was in a was in the wrong the gaslighting was fucking insane but that chapter has now been able to be closed and everyone could kind of move forward and again the only sad thing about it is that it completely overshadowed um the incredible victory that spain had over england england were one of the favorites to win the women's world cup spain beat them on penalties a very tight um hard-fought game and 
you know, again, the triumph of their success has been overshadowed because of all this nonsense. They've had to kind of feel the questions about it every time they spoke about it. I'm sure the Spanish women's players didn't have time to enjoy the glory of everything and it kind of went by the wayside. So I'm hoping now going forward, there's a more onus put on them and how they won the World Cup and they can maybe have their time in the sun again because it feels a bit unfair that they didn't have it personally for me, just looking at it from the outside in. But again, I could be wrong moving into being wrong and not understanding things i would love to know if anybody could actually get in touch with me and let me know what they think their theory on this is about so if you guys don't know dj academics is one of the most popular um, hip-hop bloggers out there he has a very influential instagram account he does really um entertaining live streams talking about hip-hop news and everything concerning american black culture in that sort of space and he's incredibly big and he has built his platform i feel like from the ground up i feel like we've all witnessed him building his platform bit by bit over the time and i don't think he's one of those people who has bought his views or buys views or anything or fakes his engagement it feels like he's got it from the mud which is probably the reason why he's so cocky and arrogant when it comes to the stuff that he does and why he attacks people so aggressively when they come after him because he knows uh, you know how much work he's put into building up his platform how much work he's put into being a respected figure in the space and he's not about to let anybody kind of diminish his accomplishments cool one thing I don't understand, though, is why this is not translating in live shows. What's happening with DJ Academics' audience that's in the millions across various different platforms, across various different um, accounts? Why can he not sell out, you know, 1,000 cap venues? Because there's an issue happening where DJ Academics went to, I think, I forgot what the, what the other festival, I think it might have been a Roots Picnic thing or something, where he was meant to do like a panel discussion, live podcast type of thing. He did it and one of the pictures or clips of him doing it went viral where it looked completely empty. There was maybe 20 people there max. And if you know anything about festival stages and it just being a stage with just, you know, open grass, having only 20 people there looks bad, like optics wise in a field as it, compared to a club, especially if it's dark. So it looked obviously horrible and everybody trolled him online. But I was just confused as to how he couldn't get even 100 people there. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should sell out the place and have it fucking wall to wall, have it super full. And obviously during the same time, I think he had a, a set clash with um, Lil Z Vert, who was performing at the time. So cool, understandable why they want a lot of people there, but why couldn't he at least have 50, 100 people there? I could never understand. So he decided, because of all the clowning, kind of probably got to him, he decided he wanted to do a couple of makeup shows to prove to people that he has a fan base and he can fill up a venue. And so far, it's not going too well. Because from what we've seen, he's had to cancel the original venue that he's going to do in Jersey City. The reason that he gave is because he requested armed security to be at the venue, which is insane, to be honest. If anything, if you're a DJ Economics, you should look yourself in the mirror and wonder why you need armed security if you're a hip-hop blogger. That means you're probably doing your job wrong. You're probably doing a bit too much. But regardless, he asked for armed security. Um, the venue allegedly got spooked and they cancelled the whole event. And I'm not too sure if I buy it because I feel like if a venue has sold a lot of tickets and they're looking to make money and again, usually for venues, I'm not too sure if it's the same in America, but a lot of the staff at venues aren't contracted. They usually, they're not, they're not salaried or contracted employees. They're usually people that kind of come in based on the event so the a venue will make you know maybe extra money or the employees only make the money when the event is on so it's within their it's within their interest to put the event on to make sure people get paid um, so i don't understand why they cancel that sort of like last minute because of that so my feeling is that most likely my guess would be he didn't sell enough tickets which is why he's had to cancel the show and move it to another venue or some venues what they do sometimes if you don't reach a certain threshold of tickets sold they'll just cancel it anyway because for them they'll say hey it's not worth our time putting us this event on because it's going to cost us more to run it than it is to get to get back money on the bar because you only have 200 people here so he's now cancelled it and allegedly the venue he's put it at is at a smaller capacity um he has done a good thing though because he cancelled it last minute i think he offered the people People who bought tickets at the original venue you offer them a refund but still they get a free entry to this new date which is a good way to kind of appease people who maybe felt like you know they were traveling in um from far or for nothing so it's still going to happen i think on the same day different venue but if you already bought a ticket you already got free so the really the venue the, the situation is happening now at the moment of the event but there's a video that's gone viral again of the queue outside and it's looking a bit light it's looking like there's 50 people there max and i'm wondering 
Can somebody explain why somebody who has millions of followers across various platforms cannot get people to come out to his show? Like, what's the deal? This is doesn't make sense to me. Let's play the clip of the people outside the event themselves. Hey, yo, we need y'all to say, ain't nobody bigger than the fucking chat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm making it. I'm about to show this to act right now when I get back inside. Nobody bigger than the chat. Nobody bigger than the chat. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Academics as fans look like academics as fans, which is is what it is. I don't think insulting fans is a good thing. Your fans are your fans. You know what I mean, they're the ones that allow you to have the living that you have and whatever it may be. So all good. I'm just surprised why he can't get 200 of these kind of kids out there. Why can't he get 300? Five? There must be because there's more of these. Most of the academics fans probably look like these kids. So why aren't these kids willing to go out and buy a ticket to hear him speak or to go to his event just to support? It really is interesting, isn't it? And it maybe illustrates the difficulty in actually selling hard tickets because I've done it. I've put on my own events. And again, my events were not at this level. I was mostly doing DJ club nights at clubs that we had already equipment and security and bars already, you know, there. So you just essentially going in, plugging and playing. And usually the agreement we had there with the place that I used to do events at and club nights at was that usually you'd get a bar, you'd get a split of the bar. So if the bar did, um, you know, five grand, you'd get 500. It was usually like 5%, is it 10? No, 10% of the bar, right? Um, but it had to be over a certain amount. So the bar had to make over a thousand or over 1,500 and then you'd get um, 10% of the bar going on. And, and obviously there's also the option of doing the door, but I would always kind of make the, the entry free because I felt like it's just a better way to get people to come in. But even with free entry, even it being a cool little dive bar that had, you know, pretty decent drink prices, it was still difficult to get people out still very 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 difficult so i can only imagine what it's like to get people at a particular venue um, a particular date um you know to pay money to go to see you it's very very hard and sometimes sometimes you get these flipping freaks that exist i'm one of them that will buy a ticket with money and on the, on the day of the event will decide you know what i'm not going anymore it happens often more often than you re realize so events um are a very scary industry to be a part in because when you win you can win big but when you flop and it's just you and your friends like what happened to one of my birthday party raves that i put on where it was just me and my friends and no one else turned up it can really really hurt i swear to god it can really hurt your ego and really humble you so i'm really wondering why academics is struggling to get people to come out one other theory could be just be the fact that he along the way has smartly bought views because that also exists there are people out there instead of trying to make their account that is really small look like it's a mr beast type of account they will buy views in line with their channel so it won't look that bait so maybe he's done that across the over the years and he doesn't really have the fan base that he allegedly does have or maybe it might be the fact that he is just a media platform people don't really care about him too much they care about what he has to say about other people so it's difficult to justify buying a ticket to his event because what are you buying a ticket for you're buying a ticket for him to like drink hennessy eat mcdonald's and rant into a camera like he does on his on live stream are you playing a uh, money to hear him interview rappers like he does on his podcast on spotify like what are you actually paying for you know what i mean that's probably why people don't know so maybe this show might be an opportunity for him to kind of prove, okay, this is what I do. This is what I put on as a show. Maybe have some videos, if there's some performances from other rappers and shit and whatever. Uh, maybe there's some skits, maybe there's an interactive segment, whatever. You have to kind of put those clips up so that people know that this is what you can expect from a DJ Academics live show. But it really was interesting for me to see it all play out because it was very evident that there is no, it's, there's a bit of a disconnect there with his fan base online and offline. And I'm hoping as a fan of the guy from afar, even though he does some fuck shit, I'm hoping that this is a humbling experience because one of the things that's always kind of irked me about academics has been how dismissive he is of the art, of the creative process, how dismissive he is of how difficult it is to actually make songs, to actually make hit records, to actually make albums, to put together videos, live shows, sell them out. It's harder than hard. The easiest thing to do is to do what I'm doing talking about other people that are successful and that are trying to do things the harder thing is actually putting yourself out there and risking it that's the difficult thing to do some people obviously just you know doesn't matter if they risk it and they have the courage to do it their stuff is shit anyway but 
you can't diminish or you can't dismiss the fact that this person put their neck out and put on a show and maybe didn't sell out but still did it and learned a lot and you know use it as a opportunity to beat them over the head to call them trash to say they're washed up to laugh at them and stuff i'm hoping that this is opportunity for him to kind of realize that you know what it's actually harder than you think to be in front of the mic in front of the camera be the main person people want to see and actually try and cultivate a fan base and draw them out to come and see you it's not easy to do and i think he was laughing a lot at like you know um new rory and more and their numbers and shit but one thing you can't deny like those guys sell out most of their you know live podcast dates on near enough they're gonna come here to london again i'm gonna go see them i think their london date actually i think i might have it somewhere here let's see if i can find it but i'm definitely gonna go see them and that's a good example of a, a podcast that isn't maybe getting the craziest numbers online but they have an actual real fan base that's something that you can't buy you know something that is really hard to kind of fathom but i'm definitely looking forward to seeing them yeah as you can see here we've got dates so they're going to be playing at the new leicester square theater i can see here according um to google um the event is going to be happening on the 17th of november and last time i checked the tickets were kind of sold out if i'm not mistaken let me actually check what tickets are available they've got them available on all those places let's see what's um ent24 saying but last time i checked the tickets weren't available there were not that many left actually when you look at the seating plan of the venue and stuff so this is a clear indication of what needs to be done if you want to actually sell out these places so look at that that's pretty decent isn't it if you're looking at the screen i would say by a percentage maybe 50 percent of the tickets are gone maybe just about over 60 um there's some vips left here in the front um but most of them are gone man like most of them are fucking gone really really cool to see to be honest i'm not gonna lie i'm loving it absolutely loving it so big up um new rory and more for being able to put on an event and obviously um it's called rory and more back on road 17th of november so we're eager to see them when they eventually come out but again it's proof that live shows are difficult to do even if you're a musician you've got some talent to showcase let alone if you're just a podcast getting on stage it's not as easy as people make it seem as and i'm hoping academics now has a newfound respect for it and he could be a little bit more chill when he's criticizing these guys but probably not going to happen and because you know how it moves you know how it moves moving on from that we have to talk about the Berghain October lineup. I'm amped for this one because I talk about these lineups every single month and I rarely follow through because I'm a flipping procrastinator. But I'm definitely, definitely going to make it my mission to go to flipping Berghain this October because this lineup for Berghain, this particular lineup is absolutely wild. I don't care what anyone says. For me, it's one of my favorite ones I've seen in a very, very, very long time. And I cannot wait to be there. I really, really, really cannot. Um, some of my favorite DJs are playing. And on the same night as that Berghain event, there's also going to be another event happening at Paloma Bar the one i've spoken about plenty of times on here called powerhouse um by the legend that is finn johansson who has one of the best music blogs out there one of the blogs that i kind of read in the beginning of my um dance music journey or electronic music journey definitely go check it out if you haven't already but powerhouse is going to be back again and this time it's going to be dj johansson back to back with dj p so on the same night or the same weekend as that October that I want to go for Berghain there's going to be a powerhouse with flipping DJ Pete bro and flipping Finn Johansson I cannot 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 wait to go there it's going to be a flipping fun occasion um, it's going to be super super amazing I need to get up here on a flipping screen so I can flip and show you bear with me a second here Paloma Bar Berlin on RA show you what I'm talking about I'm really looking forward to going but yeah, this October lineup might be one of my most favorites I've seen. And I'm happy because I was really gutted that I missed the one in August. Uh, another really good one. But as luck would have it, um, the Berghain um, scheduling gods have favored me. And I've put together two events happening on the same weekend that I'm going to be more than happy to attend. And I'm honestly, honestly super excited to go. I really, really, really cannot wait to flip and go. It's going to be an absolute barnstorm of an occasion. I can't see it here. Where is it? Is it coming up? Hold on, it's going to load. Bear with me a second. And then we can continue on from here. But yeah, there we go. There we go. Oh my God, I'm so fucking excited. So um, the October lineup for Berghain is great across the board of course um but obviously the standout that most of us are obviously excited for guys and girls at the Berghain community subreddit and all the other telegram groups is the saturday the flipping 14th that weekend 
it's going to be absolutely incredible as you can see here courtesy of the Bergheim website on the 14th of october on the main room you've got planetary assault systems live you've got dennis um denise rab playing live you've got devious one one of my favorites Elisa b igna's live who i also like ron albuquerque i like steffi and truncheon or sorry trunket um the guy that used to be one of the hosts on djs and beers one of my favorite podcasts during the pandemic a podcast that did really help hold me down and i'm sure various other fans of dance music out there uh, it's a shame actually they don't restart that pod but i'm assuming they're all busy doing what they actually love to do which is play music not talk in a microphone like i am doing here so it's not going to come back anytime soon but i'm eager to see trunket play um again because i haven't never seen him play i've listened to a lot of his productions but i've never actually heard him play so that should be really fun but the main room the fucking main room is cool, but Panorama Bar, this might be one of the best Panorama Bars I've ever seen. The only thing missing probably from this is probably Boris. So you've got Seri playing, you've got Cynthia playing, like house supremo you got gabriella quarteng i've always been e eager to go and see play there you got gerd jansen one of my favorite djs ever um you got gideon playing there who i'm a big fan of and baukhammer who i always say is one of the underrated bergheim residents and roy perez a person who i've seen play back to back with dr rubenstein plenty of plenty of times and himself solo and somebody that's always a fun time to go and listen to so this might be legitimately one of the most stacked um funnest panorama bars i've ever seen and if that wasn't enough if that wasn't enough right that that burger main room is great Ho hopefully dbs1 closes but he probably won't because i'm f i heard he's not happy with the pioneer equipment or something i don't know what's going on there but if dbs closes that's going to be a hard one to kind of miss but obviously panorama bar main room is also panorama bar sorry lineup is also great and obviously you got sal you got portable playing here live but one of the other things that's really amazing about this lineup is that on that same weekend there's going to be a power powerhouse happening and for me the powerhouse lineups are a little bit better than the powerhouse disco ones personally you know finn johansson don't kill me i do prefer these lineups more i think they're usually the combinations back to back are usually better and of course dj pete is one of my favorite djs of all time so to hear these guys play back to back and in, in a bar like panorama bar all night long until 8 a.m in the morning I'm all for it. So this is going to be one of my favorite bars in Berlin called Paloma. Um, it's basically around the corner from one of the main um, Burgermeisters in Kreuzberg. So it's a great location to go to if you want to go and pre-drink, if you want to grab a meal before the event, if you just want to walk around. I fucking love that area. And obviously Paloma Bar is great. It's got a great little smoking area, great little lounge, loads of different rooms. The toilets are really cool. Um, the cloakroom is nice and shit. The people in there are chill. I fucking love it. Honestly, honestly love it. And I think as well, well, uh, maybe because it's Kreuzberg makes sense but it might be the one bar I've been to or club that's got a very high amount of people who are kind of from English speaking countries I remember one time I went there there were like three two guys from Australia one guy from England like it felt like there's a lot of like international people that work there and in other, in other bars and stuff they usually you know I don't know if it's international, but they usually go for other Europeans or they go for people that only speak German. You know what I mean? Sometimes. I don't know. Maybe I'm mistaken here, but I felt like Paloma Bar was the one bar I went to where I saw, where I heard a lot of English being spoken, which is fine. I don't really give a fuck, but great little bar. Absolutely love it. Love the little walk up and stairs, um, you know, before you get to the door. So obviously you've got here um, the description courtesy of the RA events page. Powerhouse is back, back, back to make uh, you forget to make you forget we ever took a break we set up something special at dj pete, pete and finn johansson will flex their vinyl archives once again cramming their bags with the bottom heavy side of house um think um sound factory think church think big moments in big dark rooms think fierceness well we know paloma is not exactly big but believe us we will not notice honestly this is one of my this kind of reminds me of like why i kind of got into promoting and why i started djing one of my things one of my things that i've always loved has been that kind of you know the range between the 500 capacity and 700 capacity rooms like similar to like i don't know like a robert johnson in frankfurt those are sort of like my my like clubs that i've always fell in love with and one of the places that i will m most likely end up opening up very very soon in the future my own club will be a capacity probably max 700 that sweet spot number because i feel like those sort of numbers and even i think of places like salon de amateurs which i never got a chance to go to that club in dortmund that legendary one i always think of those type of rooms those lounge bars those 
disco rooms and shit as a perfect place to kind of create an atmosphere and ambiance because you could take it in any direction because the, sm the room is so small people don't have many places to go so they can kind of you can kind of take them where you want and you can take the room where it wants it can kind of go crazy you can kind of get simmered down and shit and you can kind of find out new things about yourself artistically the music can go in different ways um people can dance to things that they probably would never dance to and the vibe is usually just very tactile very smiley last time i went to paris was probably the greatest sort of clubbing experience i had because i remember just being surrounded by people that were just laughing and smiling everyone hugging each other everyone having little dance-offs and shit sharing adult you know materials that they had and stuff it was really really fun as apart from the other places where it's all kind of a bit serious and everyone's kind of going for their own thing i feel like paloma had that very community um personal touchy tactile feel to which i love about clubs honestly and um i'm, I'm in love with it so i cannot wait to go because it's going to be a perfect balance between going to one of the best clubs in the world one of the biggest clubs in the world right in terms of scale and what they do in output and then go to somewhere that's very very intimate so i'm really looking forward to going to those places and of course in between i'm going to be checking out places like rso i'm going to be checking out places like oxy I'm going to be checking out places like Aiden and a few other places. Um, and obviously, my, my one of my favorite havens over there, um, no pun intended, um, Club de Visionaire. I may even actually pop into Sisyphos. I haven't been to Sisyphos in years. And I feel like Sisyphos gets a bad reputation because, you know, I'm mostly consuming content of people who are you know more so in the cool side of techno and dance music and they seem to always kind of poo-poo Sisyphos. But like I said in another pod, I don't think we have any clubs in London visually experience wise that rival sissy force there's no other clubs let alone their lineups you know it's a bit tech out it's a bit you know it's a bit minimal but music aside i think there's really not you know you can't really speak of a from a point of superiority if you're from england and you don't really like sissy force you can't because we don't have one club that's even close to being as good as it so i'm really looking forward to going to those type of places and checking them out again it's been a long time coming and of course just stuffing my face full of the gorgeous fucking food over there but you know the only thing that's a bit annoying is that the airbnb prices are always so super high um for berlin nowadays it's become now you know obviously one of the most popular cities in the world and techno has only become more popular over time and Bergen has become more bait and so is berlin so those prices have increased but i have noticed when i did do the little check and make my wish list on some of the dates i want to go for that weekend for october i did notice that the prices are way cheaper now heading into the winter than they were in the summer the summer they were charging like nearly my rent prices for my flat i live in london in terms of just for weekend i was thinking there's no way that i'm paying like rent price for one weekend to go out in berlin that's fucking stupid obviously i understand the days of me going to berlin and having a whole apartment to myself for 150 euros is gone but out let me pay at least 250 euros maybe free maybe like 300 at max maybe one 200 but making me pay 400 euros 500 euros for on a weekend friday to monday is out so i'm looking forward to checking them out um a couple of big ones happening there is porn sexual happening on that weekend uh, people are saying that's a kind of bit over but you know you have to wear a lot of fetish wear to kind of get into those type of things i'm not really sure if i can be bothered to be completely honest and i'm also not really that horny you know like you know i have my i have my urges and stuff but i'm not that horny where i need to kind of go to like kink clubs to be completely fair i don't really give a fuck but i do love that they exist and people do enjoy them but they just never really it's just never been something that's kind of you know tickled my fancy if i want to fuck i'll fuck if i want to listen to music i listen but i don't really want to blend them together in that real way to be completely honest but again i could be in a minority there there's a style event happening at about blank which i only went to actually for the first time uh, a couple of years ago and I had a good time. I'm not going to lie. Um, I did really enjoy it. It kind of uh, reminded me again of some of the better clubs in Berlin because it has this open sort of like, you know, open air sort of like thing right in the middle of the club. And there's all these different rooms you can kind of go in and shit, which is obviously, um, you know, par course over there. They always have, they kind of have unofficial chill rooms. I don't think they're really good at in Berlin. They have unofficial chill rooms. So the chill room is kind of, disappeared in the uk it doesn't really exist chill rooms have kind of just turned into other rooms that you just play in but in the past there was always a room you could go to where sometimes they'd feed the music in with just one speaker or there would be no music in there at all and it would just be chairs you could just sit down and chill it's not a dark room there were usually lights in there and little ashtrays you can kind of smoke or whatever but it's just a, a place to kind of feed to like down regulate chill a bit maybe do a couple of lines maybe do a little tab maybe pop a pill but you could just you could just down regulate yourself a little bit you didn't need to be constantly moving from side to side and those things have disappeared but berlin they have them in abundance um and they're usually sometimes a place you can kind of get lost in and you won't want to leave there's an only trance ha event happening in aden um 
There's a night called HRH and the, you know, okay, there's a stub and HR, okay, different rooms probably happening. There's an underground base trip presents, um, whatever that's name is in Ava, Berlin, powerhouse. Obviously I'm going to, there's a Trezor meets wigs. Isn't that Imogen? Yeah. Okay. Um, Imogen is playing in this one. So that might be something to go to actually. Um, Trezor's playing, um, Trezor meets wigs. That's a really big look to be fair for her. That wigs is only launched recently, isn't it? And they've already got nights they're doing in fucking Trezor. Sick. Um, there's a Renat, um, as a, there's a in-house club night happening at Renate I could probably go to also and a few other things here and there but again I'm really looking forward to going to the ones I mentioned um the powerhouse happening in Paloma Bar and then of course the main night over there in Bergen so I'm really looking forward to October the 14th weekend at Bergen is sick and obviously the rest of them are great and actually they've got my guy Rene Wise is playing at the end of the month isn't it yeah, end of the month, um, 28th, Rene Wise is playing alongside Maron as well. Oh, that's a big one. That might be one I might have to check out just for the sake of it. I'm not going to lie. That might be one to check out just for the sake of it. I'm, I'm surprised Etap Kyle was here because Etap Kyle made a big statement on his Instagram that he wants to play like more housey stuff. So I'm surprised he's got him listed on there. But the 28th of October is really really big lol snake big up her you got maron um you got face fatal and renee wise playing um all on that night in bergen and then in panorama bar you got ben clock chloe um who else i like here and you got soundstream of course and live wu tank so some really good people playing on the 28th as well so eager to check that out that might be one to just fly in and fly out on but the 14th is definitely my jam but there's a lot to kind of choose from there that month and i think the rest of them are kind of light but i think the 14th and the 20th are definitely the most of the standout one to check out so if you do want to check it out go on the bergheim website and you can see it's all listed on the program it's all listed on the program Moving on, we got this news courtesy of RA regarding artists withdrawing from Japan's The Labyrinth Festival following founders' comments of trans issue. I thought it was Labyrinth that happens here in the UK, um, which would be hilarious, but it's not. It's another festival in Japan called Labyrinth. And let's see what's happened here. This is pretty crazy. Um, it says multiple artists, Surgeon, Carsten Just, Imaginary Softwoods, um, Tina Sommerfield have dropped out of Japan's The Labyrinth Festival following a series of comments on trans rights and other issues by founder Russ Monk Moench. Um, in recent months, Mo Moni, how you say it? Moench took to Twitter to share his opinions. <laughs> Why would you just say this? I wonder if this is like a self-sabotage thing. You just decide one day to wake up and just get involved in the culture wars when you've got a, a festival, you know, coming up that maybe is specifically kind of catered to people from that community or something like what, what's, what's happening here. Anyway, in recent months, um, Moench, how do you say his name, took to Twitter to show his opinions on topics like gender pronouns and trans rights. In a spat of now deleted tweets, he said the pronoun people are dumb and called the term TERF, short for trans exclusionary radical feminist, pure misogynistic hate speech. He also followed and interacted with gender critical accounts like Right Side of History, whose location is set as Turfanistan. <laughs> <laughs> Lols. Following blowback, Monch set his account to private before deleting it entirely. So again, like these guys, get involved in the culture war, get that rush of blood, panic, delete everything, and then run away. Come on. Um, then on the 30th of August, Monch sent an email to nine artists performing at Labyrinth. Um, this was after the trans activist had contacted some of them individually about Monch. In his email, which Resident of Azza has seen, he called the trans rights movement deeply liberal and totalitarian, saying it's profoundly misogynistic, homophobic, and at the center of the biggest medical malpractice scandal of the generation. Bloody hell, tell me how you really think. I just want to know what what kind of prompted this outburst why did he decide to do this especially in the run-up to his event why don't just wait until after the event to get on your soapbox spurt your rhetoric and then kind of go and for at least you collect your money at least you're kind of broken even now you've kind of number one denied people of an opportunity to make some money you've disappointed the fans and you've fucked up your own reputation reputation you know what i mean you fucked it completely why before the event even happened and for what reason exactly what spurned this? What kind of prompted him to go this direction? I'm really curious to find out. He also stated his support for the detransitioners and referred to youth gender affirming care as gay transversion therapy. He added that they're taking vulnerable kids 
who would mostly grow up to be happy gay men and lesbian women and turning them into lifelong pharmaceutical patients. <laughs> like, fucking hell. Um, according to LGBTQ Plus nonprofit, The Trevor Project, research shows that gender affirming care, okay, shut up about that. In, daily, in the days after the email was sent, Dow Records co founder, co like, we don't need you to tell us why that is an idiotic thing to say. We already know, you know? Like, Ari, we, we don't need you to tell us, okay, that what basically what you said is kind of crazy. Let us tell you why. We know why. Um, in the days after the email was sent, Dara Records founder Carsten Just, Carsten Just cancelled his appearance in, uh, via a now expired post on Instagram story saying, for opposing the transphobic views of the Labyrinth founder, I have cast them not to perform at the, this year by Ross. I've been asked, oh, he was asked not to perform. So it's not like he cancelled. Huh. The Labyrinth founder, I have been asked to not perform. Um, speaking to RA, just said that he was um, disinvited uh, from performing after responding critically. So he didn't. So why do you keep saying he cancelled? He didn't cancel. He got he this got disinvited. The language is weird in these places, isn't it? It's, it doesn't change things. But why would you say he got he cancelled when he's the one that got cancelled on? Anyway, I digress. We owe respect and protection to those who have paved the way for what the underground techno scene is today, which is to a large extent due to the community of queer trans people of color. I believe in trans exclusive intersectional feminism and that underground music scene must continue to be the safe place for queer, transgender, non-conforming people. On September the 3rd, Spectrum Spools boss John Elliott, aka Imaginary Softwoods, also pulled out of the event, followed by Surgeon and Tim and Timna Sommerfield. Sommerfeld on September the 5th I'm very sorry for everyone who's looking forward to it but also I stand behind my values okay these people did did cancel the other one didn't I stand behind my values and strongly against discrimination and anti trans rights in any form big up these people for standing on their values because again DJs are no, DJs are like stand-up comedians they're very hung money hungry they love fucking gigs and booking so the only time that they're ever gonna cancel a gig is is if legitimately somebody and their family got murdered and even that they wouldn't cancel we already see what happened with covid so the fact that these guys you know with the playgrounds and stuff so the fact that these guys are willing to stand on their morals and their principles and not play this event because of what that guy said you have to give them credit to be fair when resident advisor approached Munch for comment he sent over a general response that has been shared via labyrinth channels first and foremost labyrinth organizers and staff and equipped to support the work of the protection of transgender and non-binary lgbtqia plus people and any other marginalized person and condemn any other harm or violence against these communities unfortunately casting just performance couldn't be re re uh, realized due to a misunderstanding surrounding the core values of the event we tried to work towards i wonder if that would actually run imagine you ran an event because i'm sure there are many people in the community with, which is weird right you've got an entire community an entire subgenre an entire um an entire fucking yeah community of people who essentially espouse all of these beliefs or no entire community built on the back of these people right lgbtq please plus people and stuff and you have some people in the community who don't like those people in this community like you know her, like aggressively don't like them so i wonder if there is such a thing as putting on those type of oh, i'm just thinking now of course they exist these are just their commercial commercial events right people would say any tech house event is essentially <laughs> anti-gay and stuff i'd imagine anyway let me continue in the light of labyrinth captions um captains have issued a message on core values in the past the social media platforms to explore social da -da -da. however it's presented 100 plus amazing captains and organizers I completely reject any kind of violence. It isn't the first time Munch has come under fire. So as the events are happening though, after widespread criticism for booking an all-male lineup at a boutique Japanese festival balance, he eventually added one woman. <laughs> this guy's a troll, isn't it? Um, Sapphire slows to the bill. Munch defended the decision, gender, race, and religion, and, and, and sexuality um, are meaningless and distracting of the musical programming. As things stand, the labyrinth will go ahead as planned from October the 7th so yeah nothing has changed people have dropped out some people don't give a fuck and i guess we have to wait and see how it plays out i just think it's insane for him to kind of wade into this water just before the fucking event happens i'm really curious to see what triggered it was he what was he seeing on his side of social media that got him to jump on his soapbox and just start espousing absolutely nonsense stuff um but either way he said what he said he deleted his account nothing really changed people still dropped out and most likely the the attendees will still end up going because you know festivals are usually you know well attended when it comes to this type of thing so i guess we have to see how that plays out i guess we have to see 
how that plays out. Moving on, we have this to talk about. Last thing about clubs regarding a new club in Paris called La Nuit or La Noua or La Nuit. La Nuit, I think that's how you pronounce it, right? La Nuit, which I think is called The Night. Um, in Paris, which is open already now. Um, it's going to have the lights of Chateau Flight, Para One and Le Loop playing across the weekend. And I like it to feature it because my last time going out in the Paris properly was unfortunately the last or the first and the first and last fashion show that I've ever seen in person, which was off white, maybe four winter 2017 or something. I forgot which one it was, the one where Ian Connor ran down the um the runway um holding Virgil's hand, RIP to the go. And that was a great time to go because I had been to Paris before that, obviously, with family. Before that, of course, on my own and a few people and stuff. And I never really enjoyed it. Paris was one of those cities in Europe where I thought, you know what? It's overrated. Then I went to Paris um, working for the company I was working for, doing the online streetwear course, which Virgil was one of the um, leaders for and kind of craft the program with him, which is how I met him and stuff and whatever. We had a kind of relationship through that. And I was invited to go to that show because, you know, I had to kind of get some footage for the program and stuff and just kind of be around and whatnot. So I came to the show or I was invited over with a little bit of clout to my name. So I kind of mattered. So I got my own little, you know, I had a driver and stuff. I was able to stay in a nice accommodation. I had a company card i met some people so that kind of helped and that completely changed my experience of paris because i was a i was able to go and meet people who actually lived there um who actually knew the you know even if they didn't live there they knew the scene and they were able to kind of take me places take me to restaurants take me to clubs bars and stuff and it showed me an entirely different side of paris but one thing that i remember not really liking were the clubs we went to one club where it was downstairs basement club, very swanky, had loads of like gold and yellow lights in it and shit. Um, and they had one fashion party after party there, which was not the greatest. I feel like it kind of felt like a Soho club masquerading as a underground club. Very strange. And then we went to another place where they had most of the street where after parties would be at. I think it's a place that you see most people performing in. It's kind of got black walls, um, red leather chairs, I think. I forgot in yeah, but you've probably seen it around places. So those two places were the places I went to. And the one place downstairs was a little bit too swanky um, for me. The one that was more of a bit of a grungy place, where all the streetwear and kind of menswear fashion people would be at, that place was a little bit too run down and just didn't have a good sound system in it and kind of just felt like, you know, whatever. It, did, it kind of felt like a Soho um, cocktail bar, but it didn't really feel that really cool and interesting. So I wasn't really the biggest fan of it. And then the other time I was thinking of going to a club in Paris, was when the whole possession thing was happening. Possession, that collective out of Paris that, you know, I think spearheaded a lot of the really fast, hard dance, hardcore BPM techno soldier type of things of like 150 plus. And unfortunately kind of fell by the wayside due to some allegations around people and whatnot, um, and maybe not paying people. And they got some lawsuits against their names allegedly, blah, blah, blah. But that was the next time I was trying to go back to Paris to kind of see that side of things. Cause I've, I was eager to see what the quote unquote underground Gen Z young people side of Paris was like like what are they kind of raving to because I'm sure it exists I'm sure there are kids out in Paris who are just like me who love the music that I love but don't want to go to a swanky fucking you know um posh bar to listen to their favorite DJ play where do they go or where, what type of events are they going to and I'm sure they exist so I couldn't find them so maybe this is another example of maybe having another bite at it and seeing what the Paris sort of nightlife scene is seeing because it does look a bit swanky but it's also got programming that kind of looks like it's kind of plugged in I don't know what they're kind of doing so I'm interested to see how this kind of goes and progresses because I'm eager to maybe pop over to have a visit and seeing what it's like. So courtesy of RA, it says a new light club is opening in Paris next month, located them in the Boulevard de la Madeleine in the city centre. La Nuit is a 700 capacity space. <clears throat> Its music policy will span electronic music, avant-garde pop and hip-hop performed by both DJs and live acts um, with the likes of Chateau of Flight, um, Para One and Le Loop performing. Um, the pictures of the club are the ones that really kind of captivated me because it's a good mix of like having it be a table service club, like a swanky one that you're kind of used to and also being a quintessential nightclub. It's a good space to dance, good place to sit down. The bar looks fucking beautiful. It looks like it's kind of marble um, looking wise, like maybe it's, just the, the the facade i love the wall covered with champagne bottles like crazy i'm not sure if those are all ace of spades and shit but they look fucking nuts and i want to check out actually more of the events that they have going on there so let's actually check the ra listings to see what other events that they have coming up here um obviously the para one thing already happened let's see what other events they have coming up in the not too distant future Chateau de Louis, duh, duh, duh. okay there we go past events why not got no up and coming events 
What happened there? That's odd. So anyway, the one that just passed this weekend was Cassie D and Jules playing again. So Cassie D and, Ju and the Jules. You had another event featuring the ones I mentioned, Power One, Lucy Love, Shutter Flight, uh, Le Loop. So yeah, so the, already you can see they've got a good mix between having heads in and having people in that are not so well known. So local heroes as well. So I'm eager to see how this kind of plays out going forward. Um, I'm really, 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 really eager to see how it plays out because I think um, Paris is one of those places where, again, I've never really explored too tough because I thought it's a little bit fuddy-duddy and obviously it's a very expensive city, but this might be a good place to check out. So big up Les Nuits and let's see what happens going forward with this club and how they basically build as they progress and shit and we can see it going forward and forward and forward. Anyway, moving Moving on from that one, I want to also talk about these because I'm really excited about these. I know some of you might not be excited and this might sound a bit egregious, but Shrek, there's a Shrek collab with Crocs and I'm not going to lie, these look absolutely banging. They look so fun. Um, I've been a big fan of my Crocs since I've got them. I think I was one of those Croc haters until I actually got a pair for myself and I wear them everywhere. I wear them around the house. I wear them when I'm running little errands around the area and stuff. And they're a good in between for me in terms of wearing slides and sandals and shit. I find the whole slides and sock thing to be super annoying. But at least with Crocs, you have the ability to wear them without socks and not get your feet sweaty. And you also have the ability to wear them with socks, put them in sport mode. And you've got some shoes that you could wear and do most things. I run down the street to catch a bus i've you know took and trash out with them picked up things i've not come to the gym with them but i'm sure you can once you've got them in sport mode so i think those kind of you know sit really well with me but i think the shrek pair looks incredible you've got obviously you know the shrek motif um on the front of the shoe with the ears and the nose the same color the speckles on it the brown um fur um strap on the back is a nice little hit as well but they just look really cool i'm a real big fan of these um i can't wait till they come out there's no official date yet but the article courtesy of our uh, sorry of complex is the following hot on the heels of the of the viral um lightning mcqueen release we're now learning that Crocs is yet another movie theme makeup of the ubiquitous classic clogs on the way. For its up and coming project, the footwear company has joined forces with the animation studio DreamWorks to create a Shrek Crocs classic clogs shown here. The collab is directly inspired by the aesthetic of Shrek as it features a bright green color scheme referencing the Og's skin tone. The silhouette also features a fuzzy brown strap on the heel as a nod to Shrek's iconic brown vest along with the um, special gibbets inspired by the org's facial features attached to the forefoot stretch branding is stamped on the underfoot i like the fact that the holes that they have for ventilation have now acted as like quasi little spots to put like little accoutrements like badges and little things and stuff because i'm sure you can take those off really easily because they've got little things you can kind of slot in the hole so i love how a kind of a design that was done for function has now been kind of interpreted into style. You can kind of, you know, use those holes to kind of put little things in them, add spikes, add little badges and shit. I think it's a pretty cool little thing. Um, there's no official release date are available for the Shrek Clogs Clabo um, at the time of writing. Grab a closer look at the at the pairs below. Again, you've got the little Shrek stamp again on the insole, the the color on the outway. Like, they, they look even cool from the side. Like, I'm all for these. They look so fun. I fucking love these, man. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get a pair. Oh, oh really? They extended, they extended collaboration with Salid Bembry. I didn't know that. So big up Salid, uh, Salid Bembry. You know, he doesn't drop, you know, there's not enough of these and they always, they fucking drop them that they fucking Travis Scott Jordans. But it's good to see that he got an extension on his flipping um, clock. Oh, this is from April. So this is a while ago. My bad. Um, th so this is Salili Bembry. They say here yeah, the Crocs is on its way. The footwear brand is renewed. Has renewed. Uh, today Crocs confirmed that it's inked a new two-year deal with Salili Bembry as part of the agreement. The designer has been appointed as a creative director of their new Crocs and Pollux pod collection. Wow. Big up to him. Creative director of a division of Crocs. His new role, Bembry, will collaborate with Crocs design team to evolve the polar, um, sorry, the popular Pollux design, as well as the introduction of a new silhouette. What is a what is a Crocs Pollux? I, I, I don't remember that that design. What is that? Crocs Pollux. What does that look like? Does that look like he's 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 one he already has out, or is that like another one? Let's see here. Crocs Pollux. Oh yeah, okay. It looks similar to his design, so that's sick to see that going forward. Um, so big up to Lily Bembry. So th does that mean the Pollux is a GR too, or is that just his design? It looks like no. It looks like Lily Bembry branded everywhere. Okay, cool. That's good because I don't want it 
to be a thing where they just you know they do what nike do where they kind of they make you do they, they invite you to do like a collaboration you smash it and then they just steal your colorway and pop it out as a fucking gr layer on the other line or as a limited edition but that's not the case so i'm eager, happy to see that so yeah shrek's collab when they do eventually drop i'm gonna have a pair maybe even end up buying two because these look fucking hard body i absolutely love them look like fun and it's good to have some fun with your shoes and not take life too seriously sometimes in my personal opinion that's just me though what do i know when it comes to this stuff what do i know talking about crocs continuing on with crocs there's this particular silhouette that i didn't know existed it's called a hiker escape and aries a brand that i've been a little bit you know underwhelmed with in recent times has done a very good collab with them i have to be honest aries so far um footwear collaborations whether it's new balance or crocs and i think also the vans one they haven't missed their footwear collaborations they don't miss and this is another indication of them not missing they've got this amazing hiker and um, escape clock which is basically the same version of a clock that you know and love it's a bit more squared off and flattened on the front and it's got a bit more of a thicker sole which is also good for me because i love to have just stompers on my feet um i don't actually mind the you know the classic clog the classic crocs um colorway or silhouette but being able to have a little bit more you know um height on your flipping shoes is something that i'm not going to um you know skirt so these look really good from the top you've got the great again like i said they've got the ventilation holes here which are obviously more of a practical thing um to make sure your feet don't get too sweaty but i do like that brands are now basically using the holes as an option to kind of add little accoutrements and little details on top of the shoes such as these little pebbles and whatever it may be and it looks like my that might be a bouldering thing or something i think they look really cool from the top and i like that the strap is this rope design it reminds me of that it reminds me of the hiking rope obviously but also reminds me of um uh stefan cook's bags that that were popular for a while i'm not sure if people are still wearing them now but those stefan cook bags with those incredible ropes um you know and i think the ropes came separately those ones with pearls and this gonna look really cool that kind of reminds me a little bit of that actually stefan cook would be a good um collaboration for crocs going forward actually so if anyone watching from crocs that knows anything collaborations definitely you should hit up stefan cook i think he would actually do a good iteration of a crocs and put them out in a good way to be honest and there's a good product pictures actually they did really good product pictures for these you got a croc here with she with a seashell inside and the socks and um, rolled up to say no problemo but they look like someone wore them so they look really cool i like this picture very very well, well done um another picture of them on the side here in this kind of creamy brownie colorway they look fucking sick i absolutely love these the thicker sole more aggressive outdoors type of shit and i also like the fact that look at this this looks really cool the strap that goes on the back to make it put it into sport mode there's actually a strap at the front so because uh, me personally i like to wear mine with a strap at the front i like this extra detail i think when you take them off they kind of look a bit naked i quite like that front detail but i like that they recognize that it's a good detail also and they kind of i guess it's a two-way strap you could put that at the front or the back but i like that you have the style hit of having the rope strap at the front but then you also have the functional strap at the back which looks like it might be leather which is great because it makes, makes it mean that because mine unfortunately ripped here one of my crocs it ripped here and you know the strap kind of fell off and i'm sure you can repair them i'm sure it's a common maybe fault that they kind of tear along the um, along the flipping um along the button here where it kind of you know where you kind of uh, put the strap on so i like that they maybe have reinforced it maybe or that they added another strap that you can maybe just wrap it around here with the vera vera club and that's a pretty cool addition and then the last picture you got some of the shoe shells um i think they're how much available for 75 pounds i think they're obviously sold out by now last time i checked but i think they're available in other places as well also um to purchase i think i might might have seen them on the official crocs website but yeah you can see them available there the socks have even sold out too sick okay the actual socks for the collaboration are sold out the zine is still available people are selling zine for 15 pounds i have a zine i was selling for like a fiver i might have to put my zine out there again mate 15 pounds for a photography zine fair enough the person's well known colin dogson but still 15 pounds for a fucking zine is crazy anyway the shoes themselves you can see here courtesy of um aries you've got the crocs here in that kind of exaggerated style thicker sole they look so look how good they look in the model picture here with a thicker sole they look so fucking swaggy i'm not even gonna lie um you've got the extra kind of you know accrued mods you can put at the top you've got the extra strap at the back with the aries motif and branding at the back You've got the nice little detail with the Aries um, logo here on the button where it fastens that little thing there. Um, yeah, I love them. Look, you can put the, you cut that back strap on. You can put it at the front, I'm guessing, because I guess it's two-way. You can have that strap here and you can also put it at the front if you want. So you have two straps at the front. 
I fucking love these. They look even good with shorts. They look good like that. They're good from the top. And if anything, the 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 front of the shoe looks a bit more. It kind of reminds me this silhouette of the bottom, like the boots that Kanye was wearing, the rain boots. They kind of have the similar sort of effect. So that might be the inspiration behind it because they're a bit more squared off at the front than even my Clocks, my Crocs, sorry, not Clocks. So I'm looking forward to getting these eventually. But seventy five dollars or pounds, sorry, um, ninety five I think dollars. So far they're sold out on the main websites, but I'm sure I saw available um, on the you know standard Crocs website. So if you do want to purchase a pair, they are going to be available for you to purchase on the regular Crocs website. If not, check out StockX. I'm sure they're not going to go for too much money. But Aries smashed it. Another great collab from them. Bravo bravo absolutely bravo moving on from that i got this to talk about because this is i was very aggrieved to buy and big up whoever told me on my random show stream about this but the daniel lee era of burberry has you know officially started because all the stuff that he showed in his debut collection um, for burberry at winter 2023 is now available to purchase via the burberry online web store the website itself is pretty beautiful i'm not going to lie um as you can see from the website when you go on it it's got these amazing um pictures from some of the campaigns featuring some of the models on it wearing some of the newer stuff you scroll down um the picture looks like it's been taken on some sort of film camera so you've got a nice little grain to it and it kind of zooms in on what the person's wearing and shit so it kind of really feels it feels you know it feels luxury don't get me wrong but it also does feel a little bit um boutique it does feel a little bit hands-on a little bit with diy so you can kind of get a feel of what they're doing but the concerning part for me is when you go on men's and you go on winter 2023 collection and you see some of the prices for this new collection they are obscene and some of the stuff when you look at breakdown of the materials it really makes you question how these brands think they can get away with this shit they can get away with it because they know most people are going to buy it but me specifically i wanted that duck hat um, that was on the runway the duck woolly hat that kind of reminded me of these old hats i used to wear back in the day in school um you know with the flaps on the side and there was also this amazing fur trapper hat that had only one flap i think on one side i think the models were wearing it kind of tilted and shit and some sweaters i was looking at but seeing some of the prices i'm gonna have to be making like a gazillion a year to uh, you know to justify purchasing some of this stuff like for once for one this trapper hat which i had a, i had a hat like this similar from supreme many years ago supreme put out a hat i'm sure most of you might be aware it was like a leather hat leather trapper hat as you can see here and it essentially had um supreme written on the back and it had brown and obviously the fur underneath and i think it might have been at most i think 70 pounds i think maybe 100 even but the burberry one is 700 that already gives you an indication of how crazy they're going they've got hiking shoes for 800 they've got chelsea boots version 970 they've got a check wall hot water bottle and it's exactly what i'm telling you if you're not watching this and you're just listening to it it is the burberry check in red hot water bottle and it's 290 pounds 290 pounds right absolutely obscene they've got a great pair of shoes here shirling creeper boots 1150 they've got this shirt that was featured by one of the models on the runway i think she was wearing like a kilt as well they made it look amazing the swan print top which is 690 absolutely crazy some of the prices a belt 410 and the hat that i want in particular this duck hat is 2990 pounds nearly three grand well how much of a salary would you need to make and i guess this is the wrong question to ask because i'm assuming most people who buy burberry at this type of prices don't have salaries right they have trust funds they have businesses or they're just long money you know old money type of shit but what type of work would you need to do to be able to afford this even tremaine emery's 600 about 600 a year salary at supreme wasn't enough i think he revealed that actually in one of the articles i read that his um annual salary as supreme creative director was 600 which is not bad right so let's see salary calculator um even though there's people obviously there's like streamers who are making 100 grand a year but still to be a creative director considering i think the average um salary for a creative director in the uk is like 98 100 grand and i think in fashion it's between like 400 to a million so he was getting a pretty decent amount for somebody that didn't have a lot of experience so a uh, bigger supreme they pay well it looks like so this is um let me see here if i if i put six hundred thousand, because i'm curious to see with with the uk tax as well how much would you actually get a month if that was your salary per year six hundred thousand, your salary per month would be twenty seven thousand and oh my god english fucking um taxable income is crazy so basically your taxable income would be half 
you, yeah, you'd get taxed. You know, considering what I'm seeing on my phone, you'd get taxed twenty one thousand. I don't think you can see it there, but you'd get taxed twenty one thousand if you were making six hundred thousand a year. The gross amount is fifty k, but you would get in your account twenty seven thousand, and you'd have to pay twenty one. Imagine twenty one thousand going to tax straight away. But even with that, would you justify buying a free grand woolly hat? Would you really? I don't think even I could justify that. And if you look at the details, product details, right? Um, where is it? Uh, you can see here the fabric and the care. It's, you know, 100% wool. The filling is polyester. Like, for real. You're giving me a polyester filled hat for three grand. Even a wool hat for three grand is obscene. Even some of the best wool companies out there, right? They're not going to be charging you that much for a fucking um, duck beanie. But again, it's a really cool beanie. I'm sure other people like it also. So we're probably going to see dupes of this very, very soon. And I'm definitely going to buy it. I don't give a fucking fuck. Um, there's a great scarf here that is also 690. Like Gaga, Google. Let me see some other stuff. The medium night bag is really nice. But again, is it nice for 2490 Probably not. The blue check is beautiful though, isn't it? Let's be honest. That check pops off of the screen. The product pictures are really nice also. Uh, it's been merchandised well. That's one thing I say for sure. It is merchandised well. Um, you've got the Sherlin earmuffs, which is 350. You've got a wool blanket, which is 1,390. That's actually a, a bit of a flex. I'd actually love to wear this. Have this, you know, on on, on the plane when you go to a trip somewhere. Um, oh, look at these boots. The leather strap boots. Those boots remind me of a... Luebe, is it a Luebe or John Fernandez? JW Anderson. I'm not sure if it's his namesake label or Luebe, but he designed a pair of pants that had, you know, leather straps all over it. Sort of like bondage pants type of style he did um for fucking Luebe, I think it might have been. They kind of remind me of those. They would actually look great with those pants if you don't do the whole matchy matchy thing. They've got a Rose Prince Sherling Down Parker that's nine thousand nine hundred, nearly ten K for this Parker here. Absolutely wild. Um you got a print field jacket, which is kind of his version of an M65. That's 2,400. You've got some Burberry earrings that 290. Um, and that's it, right? All of it done. But yeah, it's absolutely crazy. The prices, um, it's probably not very reflective of the materials used. And, and it's very much placing itself at the top end, um, you know, in terms of comp competition wise. It definitely doesn't want to be placed anywhere near, anywhere below that, to be completely fair. Um, let's see about the fabric and care on this rose print Parker. 100% real farm dyed lamb shirling, sick. 100% um, the trims are polyester, 96% wool, lining is 100% polyester again, 90% goose down. So it's fairly well made, obviously made in Italy also. So it's going to feel like 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 a fucking, like a pillow. But Jesus Christ, bro. This outfit alone is like 30K, isn't it? When you think of the bag, the shirt, the pants, the shoes, that might be like a 20, 30K outfit. And it doesn't look like one, does it? <laughs> fucking hell, bro. Maybe, yeah, maybe even more with the chain also. That is an insane, insane price to put on this stuff but hey there's people out right there that would purchase it so the stuff looks good unfortunately it's you know the prices are exorbitant and i'm interested to see who's going to be wearing it i i have an international school next to me and a lot of the kids there really put it on you know they put that fucking shit on so i'm curious to see if they are going to step out wearing some of this stuff because they're usually a good indicator of like how the people that can afford it um what they like you know so let's see see what these international students end up wearing down the street when they end up being out here showing off their wares feeling themselves and acting like they are on the top of the world which they probably are to be completely fair <laughs> not gonna lie they probably are on top of the world so big up them um and yeah that is it ben of the exercise show episode number whatever it was thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you enjoyed my show make sure that you smash the like button down below if you're watching the live stream if you are listening to this after the fact on the flipping audio side of things please make sure you share it with your friends leave me a five star review i've seen other reviews on spotify thank you for those of you who've left them but i need a few more on apple Podcasts. So if you can do me that favor please make sure you do and of course any other support you want you can find that in the description support me get in touch reach out and i would love to speak but for now take care the tune of the day is going to be playing underneath my voice right now you can hear it if you're listening to the audio side of the pod if you're looking at me visually no tune of the day for you unfortunately go over to the podcast and listen to that but until next time my friends i'll see you again very soon take care and be safe peace <laughs>